pleasure to introduce John G. Van Horn, or Jack, uh, as, as he likes to be called. And um, uh, Jack is one of the pioneers of really sharing of data, and, and um, so he was involved in the fMRI data center in the late 90s, um, which sort of collected a bunch of people, submitted data uh, that was published in studies, and were able to download it, and lots of people have used it. Um, and things have sort of since evolved and snowballed in lots of different ways, and uh, there's a big emphasis now on data, data sharing, all sorts of things. And Jack's kind of in the middle of all that stuff, so um, he's going to have, for us, I think, a lot of interesting uh, stories and examples and uh, really challenges for us. And so I'm very much looking forward to your talk, and it's, I'm really glad you were able to come out and make the time for us. And uh, without further ado, we'll get you started. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. Uh, this is my first time I've been to Albuquerque, and uh, it's been very wonderful. Everybody's been so nice, and it's really uh, just a delight to, to be here. So thank you, Vince, for having me come. And I want to cover a number of different things that uh, I think are probably of mutual interest to us all. And I may be preaching to the choir on some of it, and so if I do, my apologies. Uh, but I hope that that can mean that there's some commonalities uh, between interests that, that I have and the uh, efforts I'm involved with and efforts that you're involved with that allow, can allow us to have a conversation. Um, and so I'd like to kind of talk about just some of the the, the big data challenges for neuroimaging and neuroscience in general, and what that means for us, uh, kind of where I see it, it going, and kind of what I think we need to kind of do in order at this stage, in order to set the stage for further success and and, uh, and whatnot. And part of it, it, it involves the, the technology of what we do in terms of, of neuroimaging. Let me start with kind of a, a slightly different uh, uh, take on this. About a hundred years ago or so. An innovation kind of appeared that you might have seen as you were traveling around London or New York uh, in terms of having uh, somebody with this device strapped to their chest uh, on the on a train station platform being able to communicate with uh, the, uh, the conductor of the train letting them know that everybody was on board and whatnot and this person would go and pick up this little receiver put it to his ear and he would be able to communicate with them uh, and he would walk around he was fortunately couldn't go very far because he was cabled here but this was a big innovation in its time 100 years ago also 100 years ago people predicted that in the year 2000 you might be able to sit in very comfortably in a chair and you'd look at a screen and you would uh, talk through some sort of a device here and you'd be able to hear a person uh, remotely uh, that would be projected on a screen in front of you and that uh, we'd be doing this all the time in the year 2000. And uh, sure enough, today we all have one of these in our pockets. Uh, in fact, many of the devices that uh, we have now that are mobile devices like our phones, like our iPads and whatnot, actually now are more powerful than the uh, computational power that was required to travel to the moon uh, in 1969. And being able to Skype or, or uh, communicate with people remotely is an almost everyday occurrence where you can sit in a room and talk to somebody who's many, many miles away. We all do this every day. In neuroscience and biomedical sciences, this is no different. We're actually now able to uh, take, uh, collect imaging and inf information on multiple scales from the whole body uh, all the way down to the level of proteins and everywhere in between. And this is kind of a remarkable uh, ability over the last even like 30 years or so, uh, being able to collect uh, data at these different spatial scales. Um, we very much want to be able to tunnel in to every different scale that uh, might be available to us and, and look at information across uh, uh, multiple different patterns of re resolution um, and be able to resolve different aspects of this data. But there comes as a cost. That uh, usually the more data we, or the finer we want to go, the more data we need to collect, and the more data we need to collect, the bigger it gets until it becomes so big that it becomes a big data problem. Interestingly enough, uh, we're also not looking only at space, but we're also looking at time. And across the time scales we're able to look at, we're able to look at things that happen over a lifetime. We're able to look at things which happen over a matter of minutes or hours, all the way down to molecular dynamics, which are happening at the level of picoseconds. So many, many, many times a second. And so cognition arises from this interaction of all these different layers of temporal activity. And this crosses 18 different orders of magnitude. 18 orders of magnitude, that should blow your minds. 
that is an enormous uh, time scale difference. Uh, and any one of these things can result in its own massive pile of data. And now we're very interested in smashing all that data together and creating some sort of uh, multi-omic type of uh, an ideal for how we do neuroscience research. We often have talked about the connectome and various other ohms, genomes, and, and, and uh, proteomes and whatnot, but we're very quickly going to a time when no one of those particular ohms is the only ohm in town. Uh, we're going to have being able to look at separate uh, cellular resolution and microarrays, go to cellular resolution and look at uh, mass spec, tissue resolution and immunostain, as well as whole regional and whole body uh, uh, imaging and, and uh, other methodologies uh, that can involve transgenic lines, EEG, fMRI, et cetera. And all of these things are not any, any one of these could have its own big data associated with it. So it's, we're moving very quickly to this, uh, especially as we move towards uh, something like uh, an, an RDoC, uh, sort of an ideal, where instead of defining disease based on a pattern of uh, clusters of symptoms, we're looking at disease as a collection of biomarkers or a collection of time and spatially varying uh, metrics that are different and define disease. Now, a couple of years ago, a few years ago now, uh, Science Magazine ran a special issue on some of the issues that surround this big data uh, effort and this increasingly huge amount of data that we're gathering, almost on a daily basis. Uh, and it's, um, it, neuroscience is, is certainly uh, one of those. And one of the things that science did is they asked the peer review reviewers about the top three barriers to data access and sharing that were prominent in their particular fields. Um, and about how their, their data uh, were treated. And they collected a bunch of, of things, but one of the things which was kind of interesting is that people pointed out a lack of standardization of data, that everybody kind of seems to do it their own way, they kind of grow their own uh, methodologies for how they standardize stuff. Uh, metadata, how the data that describes the, the actual data that's collected is widely varying, and people have multiple naming schemes, uh, and there's no curated databases, or rather a lack of community databases uh, that people can contribute data to or draw data from. And also that what this seems to, to mean and how it's interpreted is that the majority of our scientific research is not reproducible. Now any of you who do neuroimaging, probably most of you, probably are pretty aware that re replica replication in our field is pretty rare. We often just don't do it. Uh, because you know, there's always the quest for the new, but also because a lot of these little technical details uh, have been kind of left uh, uh, underserved. Now, why might this be going? Why might we have a big data problem in, in neuroimaging? Neuroimaging, in particular, is uh, the technology is moving really, really fast. MRI physicists earn their money by turning all the screws, right? By writing the code to drive the scanners faster, to collect more data per unit time, to get better spatial and temporal resolution. And as you go up in field strength and as these new technologies come out, that gets better and better. And so what seems to happen is you get this kind of cycle going on where you have a very, well, sorry, excuse me, uh, I was gonna say that, uh, I've published some work uh, with, with uh, my colleague Artoga where we really kind of underscore neuroimaging as big data. And one example of this is uh, the type of data that you can get off the, the human connectome scanner at the Massachusetts General Hospital uh, is really some of the most beautiful connectomic data that you can uh, obtain now. It's really a Ferrari of a scanner uh, at 3T. And it's because of these technology uh, advances that we're just gathering more and more data all the time and it becomes very quickly a very big science. And why this happens is there's kind of this cycle where you kind of start off with some advance in neuroimaging technology that allows you to uh, gather more data per unit time at better spatial resolution, um, and it enhances the kind of neuroscience questions you can ask. So you can uh, change the, if you can get a faster TR, you can present stimuli more quickly, um, you can get a better re resolution. Um, because you're getting more data per subject per unit time, you can get more subjects scanned uh, in the amount of time you'd like to do your, your, your study. Uh, you can draw in others who can use those same protocols to scan data, uh, or scan subjects, and get more data per unit time more quickly. Obviously, this has some needs for computation for data storage, which you very quickly fill up. 
uh, but then there's some desire to collect still more data, which results in advances in neuroimaging technology and so forth, and the big result is that you tend to get bigger and bigger data. So that seems to have been a, a driving force. Uh, now, why do we want to bother to collect all this data? Why do we want to store it? What's in it for us to do all this? Uh, well, we'd like to be able to replicate those experiments to answer that challenge that was kind of uh, uh, initiated in the Science Magazine, uh, uh, things that came out a few years ago, but also to ask new questions. Lots of people get kind of concerned because they think, oh, big data, you know, you know the, the, we, that, that just says that you're never gonna have to have hypotheses anymore. That if you just have this big pile of data, you'll just be able to mine it forever. I don't really believe that that's true. I think that what this, uh, having access to these large uh, data repositories affords you is the ability to generate new hypotheses that you can then go and test with independently collected data. But you can ask new questions and identify those questions that are worthy of being asked. You can teach, I've used, large-scale databases in education and as a basis for teaching. Uh, you can search them, you can uh, share data, and you can even publish new results from old data. And there are many examples of where that's happened. Oops, there we go. Visualize, analyze, model, stimul simulate, as well as understand. But in order to make all that kind of happen, uh, the curatorial and the integration uh, and the other resources that are required to make all that happen uh, actually outstrip your uh, uh, ability uh, to your ability to collect that data and the resources needed to collect it in the first place. And many times in a lot of large-scale projects, uh, the data curation and the integration are an afterthought. People don't think about that until the end. They're very interested in the question and how they're going to collect the data, and they think kind of, oh, at the end, oh yeah, we'll you know we'll put up a website, we'll put the big buy button online and uh, people can come and get the data. Uh, that's actually a mistake, and people should think about how they're gonna do that uh, from the get-go uh, in many of their big studies. Because if we're gonna go and we're gonna uh, achieve Tom Insel's vision of having a, uh, a true key science uh, that's built around biomarkers and built around uh, the ability to integrate data across space and across scales, we're gonna need access to these large-scale databases, uh, neuroimaging tools, uh, access to models which need to be constructed. Um, I was having a conversation this morning about how for, you know, the general linear model is kind of the default mode, but we actually have not had a lot of effort into really developing new generative models that allow multi-scale integration. We're gonna need supercomputers. We're gonna need some computational capability that maybe you guys have access to your, uh, here because of your proximity to Sandia and some of the other the national laboratories. Uh, but uh, many other people don't have access to. Uh, but be able to take all of these resources and go all the way from molecules all the way up to mind and all the way up to clinical significance uh, across multiple scales uh, and do so in a fluid fashion. Let me just grab a, a drink of water here. But this is gonna have some challenges. So for those people who are the investigators, excuse me, uh, discovering the data needed to, for investigation is its own challenge. You're going to need to be able to find access to, to databases and data repositories and, and, and where, what's in them and how you get access to them. Uh, and obtaining data from study investigators is often a very interesting sociological challenge. Uh, there are whole, I could go to horror stories about why people will not want to, to share their data uh, with you or with anybody else. Um, and then combining and interpreting data from across studies, even across sites, can be very, very difficult. If you're involved in a multi-site collaborative, uh, even if you're all using the same scanners, uh, the integration of that data across sites can prove challenging and involves phantoms and, and other things to make sure that that data are even combinable. But there's also challenges for the data holders, those people who are, have the data and are being asked to share it. Many times people are concerned about subject privacy. They often want to maintain the control of that data. They don't want to let it out uh, because they're interested in the uh, several other papers that they could get out of it. They're concerned to being exposed as some sort of a, of a fraud if somebody really knew about the, the insides of their data. Uh, and of course, people want to be able to receive credit for having collected that data, having pioneered that area of research uh, and whatnot. And so there's this kind of tension between those people who want data and those people who have data. And being able to uh, solve some of those problems or at least help people to get over them uh, will 
be something we need to focus on to uh, be able to achieve some of these uh, visions. Now, back in the day, uh, as Vince kind of mentioned, I got involved with, with this uh, a number of years ago. In 1999, uh, myself and uh, uh, Michael Kazaniga and several folks um, at uh, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire realized that from the cognitive neuroscience literature, there were all these studies being published and that the raw data for them was effectively being lost with the publication of each one of those. What would happen is the, the paper would come out and then the postdoc or the graduate student who did the work would move on, they'd get a job, no one would remember where the data was or how it was organized or whatnot. And they, this was a loss, right? And so we thought, why don't we put together a database that would capture maybe not all of, but certainly a big chunk of the cognitive neuroscience literature and the imaging data that was being generated. So we thought, this is a brilliant idea. We'll ask several journals if we can uh, get access to, uh, the, uh, have <coughs> investigators as a condition of publication, uh, provide their raw data, their process data, and their results images from their studies uh, that get published in, in those journals. So we contacted a number of journals uh, and were uh, uh, surprised by the, the positive reaction we got from the journal editors. They said, oh, this is great. We, you know, we're doing this for genetics, we're doing it for proteomics, we can do this for neuroimaging data too. And so we put together this website and uh, we're, we're very pleased, charged ahead, and uh, then uh, kind of word got out in the community that this wasn't such a popular idea by uh, investigators. And people started writing letters to <coughs> journals. And this is just a sample, I like to show this slide, of some of the reaction that, that happened. Uh, and it's kind of interesting when you start off with kind of some noble idea of what you want to do, and then uh, people are calling you out and telling you you're kind of a, an idiot in Science Magazine. Uh, it's kind of your worst nightmare. So people complain that the prospect of sharing data was, 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 a, he was a headache. It's too hard, right? We don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, people said, well, wait a minute, these are my scans. Why would I want to share these scans? I, my experiments are far too complicated for me to explain to the great unwashed. We wouldn't know how to do that. And there were debates over how this should be done. Um, even organizations such as the, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping uh, put out this kind of manifesto about how data should be shared, when it should be shared, and what, who should share it. Uh, and people complained, they were concerned that the bold response is something that we don't fully understand yet. So it's too early. We should wait 10 years before we start sharing our data until we understand better about the, the bold response. And even colleagues such as uh, my, uh, our institute director at the University of Southern California, Arthur Toga, even uh, put out uh, articles on neuroimaging databases, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it wasn't too difficult to figure out what kind of database he thought ours was, if you know what I mean. So despite this vote of confidence from the community, we charged ahead and did this anyway. Uh, and in so doing, we were able to get um, 125 uh, complete peer-reviewed articles uh, and their data uh, from the, the journal Cognitive Neuroscience and several others um, that they covered like 3,500 uh, individual subjects, uh, millions of M MR volumes uh, in, uh, from their raw data to their process data to their results data, as well as uh, genomic data, uh, stimulus information, and whatnot, and be able to share that data with people around the world. Um, and so, at the end, though, uh, people, excuse me, uh, people uh, 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 were very positive about it, but uh, the NIH, in their infinite wisdom, likes to get these things started, but they don't like to continue to fund them. And so, uh, due to lack of funding, we had to end the experiment. But I think that this was, as an example of a kind of big data experiment, uh, very positive because we learned a lot from this about how databases can be done, about how you can get uh, uh, neuroimaging data from people and how you can share it uh, with people around the world. And now, of course, there are these things are all over the place. And every one of them kind of uh, uh, suggests that uh, they could uh, build on what was started by us with our fMRI data center model. Uh, and also, this uh, includes uh, coins, of course, which is uh, 
your local products, but many others that you've heard of, XNAP, uh, Loris, Mitric, uh, Fitbur, and, and NDAR are something that the NIH has started, um, and anybody who is being funded to do uh, autism research um, or traumatic brain injury research are now kind of expected now that if you're funded to do that research, you're gonna submit your data to their version of a database to make that publicly available um, so that it can be available to others. <coughs> So, and that, that, that's just like raw data. Now there's a, there's, but there's a proliferation of other types of derived data as well, where you may have uh, raw data resources, uh, such as Skits Connect or o Open FMRI, uh, XNAT Central, for example, but also various derivatives of that. So moving downstream, various levels of abstraction of data, which may involve just the results maps that people generated, um, coordinate uh, systems, so sharing of your coordinates through brain map, for example, um, and various others uh, where they're uh, somewhat distant from the actual raw data, but are, can be, maybe be used in more of a meta-analytic sense as well. And then hopefully if you have pointers back to the original data, can allow you to get access to that original data as well. Now, uh, at the uh, University of Southern California, we're actually the host for a number of different databases. And this is just kind of a sample of all the different things that we have uh, done and are responsible for. Uh, in particular, the uh, Parkinson's Progressive Markers Initiative, um, which is something uh, for neuroimaging of uh, Parkinson's disease. All of the uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation investigators who are funded uh, to do neuroimaging research uh, have to uh, supply their data to, to this archive. Uh, the ICBM, uh, International Consortium for Brain Mapping, is kind of a historical uh, set of data uh, that's collected across a number of different sites in the US, in Asia, and in Germany. Um, Track HD for Huntington's disease, uh, the burn, we were very instrumental in that, the human connectome, um, and uh, the Enigma project, which is something of more of a meta-analytic version of this, but involves the uh, submission of summary images, uh, as well as uh, genomic information from uh, gene SNP uh, uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, we do all this through what we call the Image and Data Archive, uh, which we can kind of customize depending on the, the uh, ability uh, that, that uh, we want to afford the particular group. And uh, this has been probably uh, the, one of the, if not the largest neuroimaging databases uh, of its kind uh, on the planet. And it uh, has a, a very nice little interface where you can uh, upload data and search for it. Uh, you can uh, go and view data and uh, it, uh, performs little duties such as active study management and a number of other things. And you can also download data uh, from its original DICOM and, and convert it on the fly. Uh, so it's been very useful for a number of different things. Probably, um, uh, well, here's kind of a composition of all the different um, things that it has. Uh, this number grows all the time. I think we get about uh, between three and 400 new data sets per month from various places around the world. Uh, and so this thing is an active living database that grows all the time. And for neuroimaging is a fine example of, uh, of big data uh, neuroimaging with tens of thousands of individuals, dozens of uh, NIH and foundation funded projects. And literally it's been the resource used in hundreds and hundreds of research articles uh, that have been published in the peer reviewed literature. Um, it's probably its most famous resident uh, is that of the uh, Alzheimer's uh, Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. Many of you may be familiar with this if you're doing Alzheimer's disease research. Um, that if you are part of one of the many centers around the country that are collecting ADNI data, uh, you, as part of your funding, you submit your data to the ADNI database so that it can be uh, curated and then turned outward so that anybody who is interested can come there and uh, get that data. Um, that's a very powerful resource. Uh, it's now in its, I think we're in ADNI 2 now. I think they're already beginning the thinking for what ADNI 3 is going to be. Um, and every time they, they do this, they're leveraging whatever the newest imaging technology is, whether it's you know diffusion spectrum imaging or uh, whatever. Uh, they're working very closely with the, the 23andMe people to do full genomic sequencing of all of the patients that are uh, in here. And there's even some work uh, going on uh, that might interest Andy with regard to um, uh, identifying those people who are part of the database who are uh, Vietnam veterans and going and seeing whether or not they had any history of blast related trauma and you know now it's many years later uh, if that has been a, a factor in their uh, Alzheimer's or mild cognitive impairment. And all of this 
kind of comes down to some of our efforts, which have re we've recently been funded for uh, with uh, through the um, Office of Science and Technology and the NIH, uh, uh, NIH's Big Data Initiative, um, where the NIH has recognized that this big data thing for biomedicine is a really big deal, and that they needed to put some money behind it. So they had a thing called the BD2K, or Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, and at USC, we were very fortunate not to get one of these big U54 grants, but to get two of them, uh, which is pretty cool. And one of them in particular is this Big Data for Discovery Science Initiative, uh, where we're working very closely with people from the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, um, who do a lot of genomics and proteomics related work, combining that with a lot of our imaging data, and working with computer scienti scientists at uh, the um, uh, University of Chicago to be able to try and pool all that data, to try to figure out how to manage it, how to manipulate it, and how to mine it, and then be able to turn that into new discoveries uh, that are testable hypotheses that people can then go uh, and do. And so it's a little bit early days yet where we're developing this, but we're very excited about this, and over the next couple of years, uh, we expect this to be a, a real uh, major league effort for, for, for how we take a lot of this biomedical data and then turn it into discovery science. Now in the US, we're just one particular effort with the BD2K centers and, and our interests, uh, certain interest in big data certainly span the globe. Uh, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, some of you may be familiar with, uh, it currently has 17 member countries and counting. Um, it also includes Cuba, incidentally, but Cuba's kind of been adopted by Sweden. So they're kind of there, but it's kind of, they've, they've got an association with Sweden, but uh, it involves all these different uh, countries. And the principle behind this is they're very interested in building a network of interested community members who are interested to have big data or who are interested in it, who develop tools for processing of that data um, and connecting them and utilizing their uh, base, which is in, in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, to be able to uh, have community workshops, uh, Google Summers of Code, uh, outreach, uh, hackathons and whatnot, uh, node to node interactions. Each one of those countries they consider a node, and so they want to have country to country in, in interactions. They fund conferences and whatnot, and they're connected with things like OneMind, with the uh, Allen Brain Atlas people, um, Japanese and Chinese and uh, Australian brain imaging projects, and, and whatnot, as well as the Human Brain Project in Europe. Trying to connect these dispersed, um, disparate, but all kind of focused uh, communities uh, around the topics that are associated with big neuroimaging neuroscience data. Um, they do, oops, I turned my little thing on here. There we go. They have several programs for digital brain atlasing, multi-scale modeling, development of ontologies of neural structures, um, as well as standards for data sharing. Uh, I've been participated in this uh, particular one as well as this one to some degree. And they generate a lot of different things with publications, workshops, and, and abstracts uh, to try and marshal this. Um, they've developed things like, for example, this uh, uh, neuroimaging data model, the idea of trying to collect the provenance of how data is processed and stored and uh, what happened to data. Um, and so they've developed this uh, a particular uh, a framework, which maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, and you can extend it and very, it has other various features to it. So anyway, this whole uh, having big data uh, is just, it, it's, it's a thing. It's arrived, and neuroimaging is probably one of the best examples of this now. Uh, used to kind of be genomics, now neuroimaging is probably uh, among the biggest of the big. So I want to take a bit, a bit of a slight turn here. So just assuming that we have these, what can we do to be able to mine these data and how can we process them? And I want to give you an example of kind of how we've arrived at doing this um, at uh, the, our new Institute for Neuroimaging and Informatics at the University of Southern California. And the kind of thing that, that, uh, that we've put into place, uh, and it may be of interest to you, and I spoke to, to Vince about this, and it may be something that there may be some, uh, some synergies. So, we uh, we're very interested in the notion of workflows and workflow technologies for being able to mine this big database that we have locally, as well as being able to have pointers into other databases that exist around the world. Um, probably, oh gosh, over 10 years ago or so, we kind of recognized that uh, most of the neuroimaging processing steps that you do are the result of some sort of input-output methodology. 
that is controlled by several parameters, options, or flags. So for example, at the command line on your Unix box, Linux box, you might type in you know, some FSL statement followed by the name of the image, followed by a few flags, followed by the name of the output. And then you hit go. Magic happens and it spits out some new image. And then that image becomes the input image for the next thing along. And you create these process of connected sets of inputs and outputs uh, to create a workflow of these processing executables which take the raw form of the data and distill it down into something else. Now usually in any particular laboratory or institution or setting there's usually a guy and you, you probably all know the guy I'm talking about. There's some guy who you go to who knows FSL. He knows AFNI. He knows all the tools. He knows all the MATLAB. How to, how to do all that, and he knows Bash and Python and C++, and you go and you go, I'm sorry, oh guru of all knowledge, uh, I am, I'm not worthy, but will you help me write my script that helps me do my analysis? And that guy usually blows you off and you can't really talk to him because he's angry and grumpy at you. Um, but we thought that this was an opportunity, right? That there are people who would like to be able to uh, process uh, data uh, who don't necessarily know C++ and they don't want to have to go to the guy all the time in order to ask for his, uh, his blessing to be able to work with you. Uh, also, even within a particular institution or within a laboratory, you may want to process the same data in one way, somebody else may want to process that same data in another way. And while you may have some sort of canonical, this is the standard processing methodology that we always do within our group, if you want to be innovative, you also want to have a few other little irons in the fire about how to process data with some emerging methodologies. And so here's kind of an idea of, of a workflow where you start with raw data and it bubbles through a number of different uh, steps of image alignment, reg registration, normalization with an atlas, you have some sort of template for, you may smooth it, you may do some other magic, and at the end of the day, you come up with some sort of a statistical result that you want to graphically overlay and then hopefully it will appear in some sort of a journal. But you should probably, of course, recognize that this is a hugely lossy process. With every one of these steps of processing, uh, you're either you're losing information, or you're either the information it remains the same, or you're losing information in some way. And so you, uh, this whole process is usually lost. And for the longest time, people would just kind of report the statistical result, or maybe even less, a little table of the local maxima of activation, for example, uh, from a map like this, and something that they said could take basically you know, gigabytes worth of information, boil it down to a table that they can include in an email, uh, and clearly there was a lot of information that was lost. But the development of these workflows was something we wanted to be able to capture. And you're probably familiar with, uh, in the published literature now, uh, there's very little space devoted to the full description of your methods. Uh, for, in fact, I've seen examples of where people have said, we used SPM, period do their analysis, which of course doesn't tell you what parameters was used, what was the size of the smoothing kernel, what threshold did you use, did you use this normalization method and whatnot. Uh, and so all that is, is lost, uh, all that processing. And so being able to reproduce the workflow or the pattern of information loss is not even reproducible. Uh, workflow designs uh, is another thing that you'd like to be able to compare. You'd like to be able to say, okay, I want to compare this way of doing it, this way of doing it, whatever you're doing, image registration, uh, you know, some general linear model methodology in order to put them, put them head to head and make a decision about which one is the most uh, efficient, which one's the most accurate. And more than that, people are often moving outside of the kind of the box of one particular software tool set and trying to cherry pick from different ones. So you may want to use a little bit of FSL, maybe you want to use FreeSurfer, maybe you want to use some homegrown thing that you developed yourself. There isn't a, a, a very often a methodology uh, available to create kind of a heterogeneous or this Franken workflow that's outside of the bounds of, say, one particular package. And most neuroimagers, like you guys, uh, you guys are probably uh, exceptions to the rules, but uh, most neuroimagers are not necessarily programmers in every, uh, all the time. They're interested in getting results that say something special about the brain, about the brain's function or form or connectivity, but they're not necessarily programmers. They needed some, but they, they understand the workflow, but they don't necessarily understand C and they don't understand Bash um, and whatnot. So you don't 
necessarily want to be a programmer all the time, but you do want to understand how the flow uh, was uh, uh, of, of information went to produce the results, because that's absolutely critical. So we saw this as an opportunity. Long story short, we saw this as an opportunity to design and build this uh, uh, and execute uh, a, a workflow methodology that leveraged high-end computing. So we developed this thing called Lonnie Pipeline, uh, which maybe some of you have heard a little bit about. Uh, and it's now in its version 6.0 uh, release. Uh, that happened two weeks ago. And I actually have not updated my slides uh, on that. So it's, they're slightly out of date, but the basic concept uh, exists. And if you want to find out more, uh, please visit uh, pipeline.lonnie.usc.edu, because um, I think you may find this uh, kind of of interest. Um, so it's a uh, graphical workflow interface that uh, allows you to uh, design, validate, and execute, and monitor heterogeneous workflows, allows for the discovery of different tools that you might want to use, um, uh, takes advantage of distributed computing, and it's really user-friendly, and once you create these things and get used to doing it, it's actually very easy to use, and you can teach students and undergraduates uh, how, how to use this. Uh, they can very quickly get up to speed with processing large amounts of data. Uh, what you interact with looks just like this, uh, where you'll have inputs. Uh, so these point to your, your data, for example, or some uh, set of uh, control parameters or files. You'll have a set of operations which are represented by these little disks, which have inputs with flags and inputs to them, uh, and then outputs, and those can be routed and split off uh, into other modules for processing, and then you can spit these guys out uh, in some sort of an output that can either be on your local machine or on a server for you to come back to get later. Uh, so we're pretty excited about it, and you can do pretty much anything that you could do by writing bash scripts, uh, you can certainly do with this. You can do simple stuff, where this is probably the simplest type of workflow you could ever do, where you have some sort of input image, it goes through some sort of FSL maths thing, we're gonna divide it by two or what have you, and then we're gonna put out that result image someplace. And by clicking the little go button here, if I were connected to my server back in Los Angeles, by clicking on this, uh, you'd be able to go and execute this uh, quite, quite easily. And you can do simple stuff, or by having features such as conditionals and uh, kind of while loops and whatnot, you can go through and create very sophisticated end-to-end -end workflows that can pull directly from, for example, our Lonnie IDA database. We can pull from XNAP, we can pull from NDAR, we can pull from uh, various places, and Coins is one that we'd be very interested in figuring out how to do. Uh, and put together uh, these very complicated uh, workflows that take you from raw data all the way down to something that you would actually want to publish in the peer-reviewed literature. Pretty cool. Uh, here's just a couple of examples of things that uh, you can do. Uh, each of these little sticky notes is something where you can annotate your workflow. Uh, each one of these little modules uh, does something special. Um, and then this would be an example of this in action for doing uh, DTI fiber track topography. Um, here's another one that uh, does a head-to-head -head comparison between BrainSuite and FreeSurfer for uh, 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 cortical surface extraction comparisons. Um, and I can kind of show you a little bit. I don't have a, a connection to the internet here, but that's, that's my problem, not yours. But uh, here's what it looks like. Each of these guys can be moved around. You can, part of the art in this is figuring out how to place everything so that uh, it, it, looks, it's, it looks cool. But we have a lot of library over here, which has like, for example, FSL. It has modules that we've already pre-built. Any tool set that you guys are developing yourselves if it's command line executable, uh, if it's Bash, Java, C, uh, Python, or what have you, but it's executable at the command line, you can turn it into a Lonnie pipeline library of your own and save that. But for example, if you wanted to, uh, say, have uh, Flirt, for example, you could go and select it from the library, drag it over there and drop it, and if my connection worked, it would drop itself over there, because none of these live on my machine, they're all remote, so that library is remote. Uh, but anyway, it updates itself every time you log in. And once I had, had built this, and if I were connected, which would be indicated down here in this corner, by clicking this, I can make my connection uh, to my server. And once I've done that, if I hit the go button, it would go and launch. And uh, if, if I, see, if anybody is interested, I can kind of show a little, if I get a connection, maybe Vince can help me, uh, I can show you kind of how this works in action. If you go and run this, what happens uh, is that it starts and it goes through a validation step uh, to make sure that all the executables and all the data are where you said they were. 
it goes through and uh, you'll end up seeing a bunch of segmented circles which when that particular module is the one the, uh, in, in operating at that moment, you'll see this little segment, segmented circle orbiting around each module. When it completes, uh, it, go, it turns green and moves to the next one. Excuse me about that. And then when it gets all the way done, down, down to the end, you've got a field full of green segmented circles, and that means that things have, have completed successfully. Then, if you were to run this particular workflow, you'd be able to go and take your data, uh, the result of this, you can re pull right into track viz, for example, and then you can go and have a nice pretty image like this, and it takes about, oh, a minute and a half to run. Uh, if you have multiple, you can pile in as many subjects as you like, uh, and it takes advantage of the parallelism of our, of our compute system uh, back in Los Angeles, um, and it would take advantage of yours if we were running it here. So, kind of a cool little thing uh, to be able to make uh, workflows that can process large amounts of data, leveraging big computation and big cluster computing, um, and the little graphics that uh, you, you are there make good figures for your articles and your posters. So it's win-win to use Lonnie one. Uh, I hope you will. So uh, behind the scenes, I mentioned that we have a uh, pretty big uh, a compute cluster. We've actually installed grid, uh, grid clusters uh, at UCLA uh, across multiple different uh, 1,200 cores and 4,300 cores um, at UCLA. Um, we have an uh, Amazon Cloud instance, um, there's a, like a University of California grid, Globus, um, but our I and I cluster, this is now woefully out of date. This is out up to about 4,000 cores. Um, some of the rest of this is still uh, legit, but uh, we have about, I think it's now about four petabytes worth of online storage to be able to store data and results. Um, and it's all kind of geared towards the use of Lonnie Pipeline as the engine for processing all of that data. So uh, this is kind of a picture of what it all looks like. We're really into the pretty lights. Very, we're simple people. We like small, shiny objects and flashing lights. But now what I want to do is I want to show you an example of something that's interesting, at least for me, to be able to go and draw from a big archive of data uh, to be able to leverage the Lonnie Pipeline uh, to be able to do something interesting uh, with data. And so I want to share this with you because I think it's kind of it's kind of cool, it's cool for me to do, um, and it plays well with kind of a neuroscience focused audience. And so hopefully you'll appreciate this and, and view this kind of as I do, as kind of a little success story of, kind of, uh, of doing something useful uh, with, uh, with, with data. So you guys are all pretty familiar with uh, the case of, of Phineas Gage, right? Does anybody not know who Phineas Gage was? You don't know who Phineas Gage was. Well, bear with me, sir, and I'll, I'll, all will be revealed. So Phineas Gage is, is probably the most famous neurological case in all of neuroscience. Uh, probably you will run into him in the first 10 pages or so of any uh, Psych 101 book. Uh, and uh, he uh, was the victim of a very kind of tragic railroad accident back in uh, uh, the 1860s, uh, or 1840s, excuse me. And um, the story of this is kind of interesting, and it happened to kind of fall in my lap a little bit. And I want to tell you that story and kind of share with you how I kind of did something using all these things that I thought was kind of interesting. So, but first let me tell you the story. So, Mr. Gage was uh, uh, actually, uh, the, the case in question, um, he was a 25-year-old uh, foreman in preparing this railroad bed at the uh, Ralph and Burlington Railroad just outside of the town of Cavendish, Vermont, which is a very rural little town in, in, in Vermont. Um, and traditionally, when you were clearing the railroad beds, if you've ever been to New England, you've ever been to kind of northern New England and Vermont and New Hampshire, there's granite everywhere, just because it's very mountainous, lots of granite. In order to flatten everything, you have to remove the granite. And so work crews would go and they would drill a borehole about oh so deep or so, about, I don't know, 12 to 18 inches deep, uh, and then they would fill the bottom of it with black powder they put a fuse in, and they would put some sand on top of the fuse, and then they very often they would use a thing called a tamping iron to go and tamp down the contents and just kind of make sure it was all packed down in there. And then they would light the fuse, run like hell, the rock would explode, and blow it up into rubble, and they'd go and remove the rubble, and then they'd move systematically down the train line, right? Well, in this particular instance, Mr. Gage was the foreman of this, and he was in the act of doing this. And he was either demonstrating it to his men, or he was just kind of going through the, the motions, and his men were apparently behind him, and he turned his head at the critical moment 
uh, up and backwards to say something to his men. And at some point in all this, it's not quite sure when, uh, somebody forgot to pour the sand in on top of the fuse and the black powder. And so when he took his tamping iron and dropped it into the hole, it hit the edge of this granite hole, caused a spark, bam, big explosion. And this tamping iron shot up as he was looking over his shoulder, shot up underneath his zygomatic arch, behind his eyeball, and up and out through the top of his head. Knocked him over on his rear end uh, and uh, uh, knocked him out um, uh, for a little while. Um, but uh, he was able to eventually kind of sit up and talk to his men. Uh, they, and they uh, put him on an ox cart and they took him back into the town of Cavendish. And first he's met by one guy who kind of like just <clears throat> stabilizes him. But then uh, Dr. John Martin Harlow came in and uh, commenced the treatment of, of the wounds. And the wound in this case was so severe, this tamping iron, I'll show you a picture of it in a second, it's about three feet long, weighs about 19 pounds or so. Uh, it's shaped like a javelin uh, and it basically just cut a hole right through his head. And the wound was so severe that Dr. Harlow was able to take the index finger from his one hand and the index finger from his other hand and stick one up under his cheek and one down through the top of his head and touch his fingertips somewhere inside of his head. Uh, and he, Dr. Harlow was able to kind of pack what was left of his brain back inside of his head and fold the bone back over. And Gage struggles in it for days in and out of consciousness and fever and he's confused and it's kind of a thing. Um, they were sure he was going to die. And, uh, he eventually suffers uh, some confusion and difficulty reasoning, etc. But eventually, he's able to recover sufficiently so he can go from his from from uh, back to his family home uh, in in New Hampshire. Um, but as famously, he suffers a lot of profound cognitive and personality uh, changes as a result of this. Um, that Dr. Harlow himself goes and describes in, in his not one but two papers, uh, which I'll describe a little bit more in a second. In his first paper. Uh, he points out that, uh, uh, about a number of things about, about Mr. Gage, but that his, the equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seems to have been destroyed. He is fitful, irrelevant, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, uh, manifesting little deference for his fellows, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and previous to his injury, though untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him uh, as a shrewd, smart, smart businessman, very energetic, persistent uh, in executing all uh, his plans of operation. But in this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly so that his uh, friends and acquaintances said he was no longer gauged. So even those people who knew him thought that he had you know, severely changed uh, as a result of this injury. Not surprisingly, this was a very traumatic injury, uh, and so it's not entirely surprising that this would be, uh, uh, have caused some degree of change. This is the tamping iron in question. Uh, again, it's uh, about uh, 110 centimeters long. Uh, it's shaped like a javelin. You can kind of see it has a pointy end here. It's kind of more blunt over here, kind of fatter in the middle. Uh, weighs about, uh, excuse me, about 13 pounds. And uh, you can see these little chicken scratches on it. I'll come back and talk about those in, in a moment. Um, but uh, it's on display at the Warren Anatomical Museum in, in, at uh, Harvard Medical School. So if you're ever into, uh, uh, Ten Shattuck Way in Boston. You'll want to stop in and, and, and take a look at it. Um, and uh, various times over the, the course of, of the case of Mr. Gage, people have attempted to model this particular injury. Uh, Dr. Harlow himself in 1868 had this woodcut uh, block uh, cut uh, drawn up to show the trajectory of the tamping iron and to show the skull. Um, another physician by the name of uh, Henry Jacob Bigelow became fascinated with this because he wasn't sure that it was even possible for somebody to, to, to survive an injury like this. So he went to, he was at Harvard Medical School, and he went and found a, a skull kind of probably on a shelf somewhere in an anatomy lab, took it down to the, the, the uh, uh, machine shop and asked him to bore a hole through it so that he could demonstrate that the tamping iron could indeed pass through uh, the skull uh, in the way that uh, was described. And he had, this little picture drawn up. Uh, various other people have attempted to model it computationally. Other people have attempted to do silly stuff, which looks like a Halloween skull with a you know, toilet paper tube poking through it. Uh, and this never happened. Uh, and he never was walking around with, you know, with a cocktail or whatever, at parties, talking to people about the things stabbing through his head. Um, but we had an interesting opportunity, uh, which kind of fell in my lap. I had written to uh, the uh, people at Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, about this particular data set. Oh, excuse me, before I get to that, let me show you some of the pictures of what the skull looks like. 
Uh, so this is the, the skull itself. This is also on display at the Warren Anatomical Museum. Uh, these are some of the highest resolution, best quality photographs that have been taken of the, the gauge skull. The ones that you can kind of see online or in various uh, articles uh, are pretty poor quality. And it's hard to really appreciate what the skull looks like. So and you guys are among the, some of the first to see these pictures, which is kind of cool, um, because uh, you, you can really kind of see what the, the skull looks like. So uh, here is a, a shot looking uh, up underneath the, this is the zygomatic arch here. Uh, here's his, his uh, upper jaw. You'll notice there's a, a particular tooth missing here. It's kind of left rearmost uh, molar here. This is looking up the hole as it goes through his skull. Uh, here is looking kind of down through the hole as it comes up uh, through the, uh, as the tamper guard would have come up through his brain. Uh, you can see this giant crack here where his uh, temporal, or sorry, frontal and temporal bone here was kind of separated. Uh, a bunch of jagged pieces left over. Um, here's looking up through his eye socket. You can see this goes up through his frontal bone. Uh, and this is looking inside of the calvarium at uh, this kind of, kind of uh, oblique looking uh, hunk of uh, bone that was, was there. Uh, you can see that there were even some pieces missing where presumably they're probably still on the ground in Cavendish, Vermont someplace. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, these are all courtesy of uh, the people at the Warren Anatomical Museum. But uh, in 2001, uh, two investigators at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital um, had done some CT imaging. And this is what that CT imaging uh, looks like. Uh, and after they were kind of done doing the CT imaging of the gauge skull itself, um, the Warren Anatomical Museum people got very concerned because the skull is, you know, it's over 150 years old and they're very nervous about it. And so they really don't like to loan it out to be scanned anymore. So these are the last best data that were ever obtained on the gauge skull. It had been scanned a, a time or two before, uh, but these are the, the last time that they were, were scanned. Uh, after these guys were done doing the imaging and doing what they wanted to do with it, these data were lost to science for over 10 years. <coughs> and I kind of recognized that. And so I contacted the people at Brigham and Women's and I said, you don't happen to know where that Phineas Gage skull data happened to go, do you? And uh, they said, hmm, Phineas Gage, yeah, I think I remember something about that. And through a little process of cajoling them and whatnot, uh, I was able to uh, have them look around and find it. Uh, it turned out it was in an older CT scanning uh, imaging format that they didn't know how to reconstruct, so they just sent it to us and they said, you guys can reconstruct it, you're, you're happy to have it. And so we were able to reconstruct it and that's what, what this looks like. But because we had the skull, we were able to actually do some interesting things to it. And I kind of got thinking, well, what if I could draw from our large database full of all of these subjects and identify as many subjects as I could who were in the right age range, who had the right handedness, who were right gender and whatnot. Could I reconstruct a brain for Mr. Gage using these data? So I drew from our Lonnie Image Data Archive. I went and I did several searches to try and identify people who were uh, uh, psychiatrically and neurologically healthy. You know, again, we have lots of ADNI data in there, so there's lots of people who have uh, age-dependent uh, uh, illnesses and whatnot, and Parkinson's and other things, so we had to find some, some people who were healthy and normal. Uh, I chose an age range of 25 to 36 because Mr. Gage was 25 years old when he had his injury and 36 when he died. Uh, I chose right-handed Caucasian people to be at least in the right, you know, handedness and gender as Mr. Gage. And we chose from the, uh, from the database um, the MPRH-T1 anatomical data uh, as well as 30 direction diffusion weighted imaging data. And then through a process of using heavy, heavy doses of Lonnie Pipeline, we leveraged Racer for TrackViz, as well as some custom software that we had to do, um, a number of other things, we were able to go through and fit the T1 data and the, the, uh, the diffusion data into the cranial vault of the gauge skull. Pretty cool. We had all sorts of workflows that we designed uh, to do various registrations and have all involved all these different tools as well as homegrown stuff, as I mentioned. And here's just one example of something we built to go and do the, this analysis. And so in this process, we were able to create three-dimensional models of the gauge skull. So here it is, should look a lot like those pictures I just showed you. Uh, we were able to separate the jaw, which kind of is a very important aspect of this. We were able to separate the frontal bones and the other bones that were broken as a result. And we're able to uh, identify from looking at the skull itself various landmarks that we could use to help reconstruct the trajectory of the tamping iron through his skull. 
Uh, and so we're actually able to go through a million different possible trajectories uh, using our large cluster, uh, iterating over all these data to try and identify the best possible uh, trajectory. And so this is kind of an example of the trajectory we arrived at showing our simulated tamping iron, which we actually went, we physically made measurements of the tamping iron itself to be able to model it uh, and model its trajectory through uh, the skull. And one other thing we, we, we found with this data is the data that was sent to us came with a secondary set of data. And I didn't know what it was. When I reconstructed it and looked at it, it had the shape of a head, but on the inside it was all kind of globby. All kind of, it, didn't, it wasn't like brain. It took me a while to figure it out. If you visit 10 Shattuck Street, you visit the Warren Anatomical Museum, on the shelf right next to the Gage skull is a life mask that was made of Mr. Gage. When he visited, after his injury and he recovered, he visited uh, Dr. Harlow at Harvard and uh, they had him sit for this life mask. And uh, so it's sitting there on, on the shelf next to it and the people who collected this data had, had the forethought to image that as well. And so from that we were able to create a surface of that so we actually have the skin of Mr. Gage we can put on him. Uh, so we had his skin, we had his skull, and then we were able to fit the uh, uh, example, or for all of our 110 subjects, fit the, uh, the T1 data uh, into the cranial vault of Mr. Gage, uh, and we can see how it uh, was affected by the, the transiting of the, the tampering iron. At the same time, we were able to go in and do fiber tractography and look at what brain areas were affected by the tampering iron. Uh, so this is kind of the hole that uh, all those fibers that uh, intersected the trajectory of the tamping iron and, and even little areas around it, uh, we were able to go and model that. And this is the, an example of kind of the minimum set of fibers that uh, were intersected by the tamping iron, showing you that not only do you have stuff just within the hemisphere, you have stuff going through the genu of the corpus callosum to the uh, superior frontal regions of the, of the opposite hemisphere. Uh, and be able to do this. And this is just kind of a summary image of going all the way from the skull, multiple different possible trajectories that we uh, model, and uh, going all the way through to uh, modeling uh, how uh, the fiber tractography was intersected. And so here's a little movie of, of this, uh, and I hope that you'll agree when you look at this that this must have really, really hurt. <laughs> so if you look at this, this must have really smarted. Um, in fact, it was interesting that. Uh, Mr. Gage, when they found Mr. Gage, they found that his eyeball had been displaced by up to an inch out of his skull. Eventually, he lost sight in that eye. Um, he, he had some sight initially, but uh, he uh, lost that sight. One thing you'll notice is that his jaw was open, uh, and you, you'll notice also that uh, the trajectory of the tamparin kisses that little tooth in his, his left uh, top rearmost molar. Um, and the, uh, his jaw was open. Remember, he was saying something to his men at the time of this explosion, and so if you didn't open his jaw, the tampering iron would have hit his jaw and broken, and we found no evidence that his jaw had been broken or even touched by the tamping iron, and so he must have had his mouth open saying, you know, hey, you guys, quit clowning around, or hey, guys, watch this, or what have you, at the fateful moment. We were then able to go through and do some computational modeling. Uh, this is an example of one of these uh, connectome diagrams that uh, me and my team have been, become so fond of. Uh, let me just explain these a little bit because they're kind of a, uh, there's a lot going on here, but once you begin looking at these, they're pretty easy. Uh, they're kind of like a clock face, but with the uh, left half of the circle representing the left hemisphere and the right half of the circle representing the right hemisphere. Each of these little kind of wedges, right, here, for example, represents a lobe, so like this is the frontal lobe, here's the, uh, the insular cortex, here's the limbic lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and we stuffed all the uh, subcortical areas uh, and brainstem down here at the six o'clock position. Uh, going uh, inward and outward here, you have kind of a colorized code for uh, how you parcelate the brain so that you can look at a parcelated map of the brain and see if by color coding what's what. Uh, but then we have a number of different metrics which are coded here. And in this case, we're coding between the centrality of the, of the node in this network, its eccentricity, its mean local efficiency, clustering coefficient, and the percentage of gray matter volume loss uh, as calculated by, by us. One thing which is kind of interesting about our analysis here is that what we, well, historically people have always talked about the cortical damage that Mr. Gage experienced. By our calculations, we found that like 4% of his cortical gray matter volume was intersected by the tamping iron, in contrast to 11% of his white matter volume. So in as much as this was a, ever a story about cortical uh, gray matter 
uh, affects Mr. Gage. It's also a story about connectivity uh, and gray matter connectivity. Uh, we did a bunch of uh, uh, white matter network uh, analyses. Uh, I apologize for this very numerically complex uh, slide, but the take home message is here is that the injury that Mr. Gage uh, experienced very severe, certainly significant, and certainly must have had an effect on, on his uh, cognitive well-being. But if we systematically move the lesion around to other parts of the brain and, and ask the same questions about how much of his uh, network segregation and integration were affected, it turns out that there are other areas where the injury could have been much worse. And irrespective of whether or not it would have killed him, uh, the effects on his network would have been much more severe. So uh, kind of interesting for, for in, in this particular case of a very severe brain injury that it could have been worse for Mr. Gage. Um, one thing which is kind of interesting about this is that uh, about the shortly prior to the time that we did our analyses, uh, these daguerreotype images uh, kind of showed up online uh, where the people, the Wilgus family, uh, had this picture in their collection of somebody that they referred to as the whaler. They didn't recognize him for anybody special and thought this was a harpoon. And they put this picture up on uh, Flickr and they asked people, uh, you know, hey, do you know anything about this whaler? They're apparently daguerreotype enthusiasts who share these things with each other. And people looked at this and they said, well, it doesn't really look like a whaler. That doesn't look like a harpoon. He's kind of dressed a little bit different than the traditional whaler from the 1840s, 1850s. And somebody said, hey, I wonder if that's not an image of that Phineas Gage guy. And the Wilgus couple said, Phineas who? And so they did some searches and they found a, a gentleman named Malcolm McMillan, who's an Australian, who has made it his life's work to study all things Phineas Gage. Uh, and it turned out that uh, they, these little, those chicken scratches I noted on the uh, tamping iron in the picture I showed you before, uh, you can actually see those on this particular tamping iron. If you zoom in on this, this little the thing, it actually says something like, this is the, the tamping iron that flew through the head of Phineas Gage on this date in you know, 1840, uh, whatever. And uh, so they were able to identify that this is probably your guy. You'll notice that he has ptosis of his uh, left eye here. There's a little scar on his head. Uh, and there's actually a little scar running underneath the zygomatic arch. So they're pretty confident this is the guy. And then not too long later, uh, people who are members of the Gage family had this in their collection, which looks like it was probably taken about the same time, that again shows that inscription uh, on the tamping art. And the thing that's interesting about this is, I looked at this, these pictures, and this guy doesn't look anything like the mental picture I had of Phineas Gage. It was kind of like, you know, the homeless guy living in a box under the overpass. Uh, he just looks totally different. Uh, people had described him and given him, you know, said he's a white or an abuser of women, he's this alcoholic, and all these other things that largely the only two people who ever saw Phineas Gage and wrote about him were Dr. Harlow and Dr. Bigelow. Everything else has kind of been extrapolated and in fact kind of uh, invented on the basis of this notion that he had turned into this animal this kind of creature, and uh, this is several years after his, uh, his injury, and he doesn't look like that bad a guy. So irrespective of him having a very severe brain injury, which could have been worse, uh, it looks like he was able to actually, you know, be a decent guy. He actually took a large repository of data, workflow computation, grid computing, and be able to stitch that all together with this very fortuitous being able to get a, a CT image of the gauge skull, to be able to stitch that all together and make something out where nothing had existed before. The key element in this is that I didn't collect any of this data. I mean, I didn't put anybody in a scanner. I didn't scan anybody. I just drew from resources that were out there uh, to be able to pull this off. So allow me to kind of just reach some conclusions here because we're running a little bit long, but uh, I apologize for that. But in a sense, with neuroimaging data, neuroimaging data is big. It's data is back, it's bigger than ever. Uh, and it's now the primary example, or among those, of the biggest of the big. And uh, we're collecting it every day, probably every day here. One of my favorite stories to tell my undergraduate students is that, or my graduate students, is that when I was a graduate student, I was asked to buy the hard disk that stored all the data for our laboratory. And I went out, in, in 1991, and I went out and went shopping. I got the biggest hard disk I could find. And at that time, I thought four gigabytes was infinity. I'll never fill this up. This is awesome. And people would come to the lab and gaze upon the disk because it was so rare. Now, you know, four gigabytes, you eat for breakfast. It's nothing. 
um, and we're, you know, we're dealing with like four petabytes worth of storage at our center now. Um, which means that the big data problem is really the data that you haven't collected yet because we will double the average size of a neuroimaging study every two years according to Moore's law and a number of other factors. And so what you gather today, tomorrow, will be cute by contrast, kind of interesting. And integrating neuroimaging data with genomic data, with proteomic data, with multi-scale data, all those 18 orders of magnitude in time and of course across space is going to be a major challenge. It's going to need algorithms and clever people to kind of put all that data together. Um, and there are active ways uh, or active efforts underway to do this in analyze and assist researchers and perhaps you guys are one of those. Um, and computational resources uh, are now available to be able to make analysis of big neuroimaging data more streamlined, to leverage workflows, lever com le leverage computation so that you don't have to have it locally, it can be out in the cloud or located elsewhere. So there's big opportunities here. Uh, workflow methods such as pipeline are really cool because they put this analytic power to be able to draw from these big databases into your hands. So if any of you are graduate students or something, this is a great opportunity to write chapter two of your PhD dissertation, right? So before you're ready to collect data on your own, you can go and build, uh, draw from these resources, generate hypotheses that then you can test in your subsequent chapters using things like Lonnie Pipeline. Um, and my well, Phineas Gage story is just one example of how you can kind of take these data and do something useful and cool with it that told you kind of the rest of the story in regard to something that's historically significant with neuroscience and neuroimaging uh, and tell you something about the brain and health and disease. So there's massive opportunities across multiple different subdisciplines of neuroscience, uh, but more success stories are needed. There are still people who aren't convinced that this is worth it. And so hopefully you guys will find ways to uh, develop your own success stories. So let's get to work and, and do some of that. Um, let me just uh, conclude by thanking all my colleagues at the Institute for Neuroimaging and Informatics at the University of Southern California. If you're in town, come visit us. We always like to have visitors. Um, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Vince. Really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.